So let's get into our membrane-bound organelles. Now, this may be a little anti-intuitive because you may not think the plasma membrane, the boundary of the cell itself, you may not think of that as an organelle. Just like you may be surprised when I tell you what the biggest organ in your body is. Does anyone know that trivial pursuit answer? Your skin. Your skin is the biggest organ, more surface area than anything else. So the plasma membrane is important. It defines what the cell is, the extent of the cell. Now, we've already talked about phospholipids. We're not going to get into that again. That's going to be another chapter. But we also have proteins completely embedded, and proteins do a ton of stuff. We saw that whole list of what proteins do. Most of that happens on the plasma membrane. But what I want to impress upon you with this fluid mosaic model is the proteins are not embedded in a concrete layer of phospholipids. The phospholipids are floating around. The phospholipids can spin, they can flip over, and so the proteins, they're just floating as if the phospholipids are water and these proteins are ships. That's why we have this fluid, movable model Mosaic because there's so many different components. For every protein in the membrane, there are 50 phospholipid molecules. But yet proteins make up half of the mass because they're so much bigger than our phospholipids. So here we've got already two of our groups, right? We've got proteins and lipids here in the membrane. Well, guess what? You can put sugars on those proteins. So in our membrane, the only thing we're missing is nucleic acid, simply because it's compartmentalized elsewhere. That's how diverse our plasma membranes can be. So, short list of functions of plasma membrane proteins. Receptors, enzymatic activity, transport, like with diffusion, active transport. And then they're also going to be hanging on to each other or hanging on to something that they're sitting on, this basement membrane. If you didn't have some of these anchoring receptors for your skin, you would have these big, huge blisters on your skin. There's receptors that hang on to these molecules in your basement membrane called laminin, and that's what's holding your skin on, holding your skin together. If you didn't have these receptors for laminin, or if laminin was jacked up, you would have this horrible disease called bolus pemphigus. It's awful. People used to call this leprosy back in the day. There's another disease called leprosy now, but all skin ailments were simply leprosy. Now we're going to move into a grouping, an organizational component that we call the endomembrane system. Endomembrane in the sense that there is some either direct physical or functional connection. That's going to include the nucleus. I've tried to color coordinate these. The nucleus where we have our genetic material. We're also going to begin to assemble the components of ribosomes in the nucleus. The nucleus is going to be physically connected to the endoplasmic reticulum. And material that's synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be transported in little vesicles, little shuttle vesicles, to the Golgi. And the Golgi, being the post office of the cell, is going to send that material to its final destination. Now that's the end of that sort of endomembrane system as we think about it in animal cells, but we also have that vacuole, this large structure inside of plant cells. And then some of these little vesicles that are produced and come off of the Golgi, they're going to stay inside the cytoplasm of our animal cell as lysosomes. Lysosomes are going to be proteins, enzymes that can degrade materials. Or you may have other membrane-bound little vesicles that contain superoxides or peroxide ions, so we call them peroxisomes. And these are illustrated, these little bubbles that you see inside our animal cell. So we're going to take each one of these one at a time as we go through the endomembrane system. 
the nucleus, that's where our DNA is stored, our genetic code. The nucleus is interesting. When you see a double membrane, do not think of a lipid bilayer, okay? You know, our plasma membrane is a lipid bilayer, right? Those upside down looking phospholipids. The nucleus are four lipid layers, two lipid bilayers. And it's because of that fact that a lot of evolutionary biologists say, well, you know, the nucleus used to be a separate organism. It was a separate organism that was good at organizing its code, at organizing the instructions. And it set up a symbiotic relationship. Are we good with symbiosis? Where two organisms share something in common and it benefits them both? So they say that this single membrane organism that was good at having the instruction and this other single membrane organism that was good at making energy, they got together and this DNA containing organism got somehow transported inside the other and as it was transported in it picked up the membrane of the host and that's the second membrane like endocytosis now that's the speculation and when we look at these membranes later on and look at their components and their composition it's going to be further supporting evidence of maybe those similarities and maybe those kinds of relationships now the nucleus is not a solid spherical structure that you may see. It actually has holes in it, pores. That material can move in and out of the nucleus, and it's not going to happen willy-nilly. It's going to be very regulated, and they're going to be transported in a particular direction. So you're going to have guards standing at these pores to make sure nothing gets in that's not supposed to, and nothing gets out that's not supposed to. Now, as we look at a transmission electron micrograph, we can see the double membrane of our nucleus, our genetic material inside, but many of our cells are going to have a really dark spot that we call the nucleolus, or some say the nucleolus. This is dark because there's more stuff, and the more stuff there are ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNA that's being produced and synthesized in that location before it's transported out to the cytoplasm. That's why it's darker. Anything you see dark in electron micrograph, it's just more stuff. So if messenger RNA is formed in the nucleus, what process then would we say happens in the nucleus that involves copying DNA into RNA. Trans, transcription. I'm repeating those words a lot, aren't I? You, 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 get, you get the meaning, right? Transcription happens in the nucleus. So here, here's an illustration showing an artist's concept of the double membrane. Here's the inner membrane of our nucleus. There's a space between the two and the outer membrane of our nucleus. They're also illustrating the pores. It looks like a wiffle ball. That's what the nucleus looks like. Everybody know wiffle ball? But what I also want you to understand and why we call this an endomembrane system that includes more than just the nucleus, do you see how this space between the nuclear membranes is continuous with the space of our endoplasmic reticulum. That's the physical connection. And it's just the outer membrane that then folds into these folds that we know as the endoplasmic reticulum. So the nucleus stores our genetic code, processes ribosomal RNA, and this is just an illustration of those pores and all of the proteins, maybe upwards of 100 proteins that allow and direct the transport of materials in and out. So it's a highly technical, highly regulated process. Again, it's not just an open hole that anything and everything 
can get in and out. I like that your textbook says that there has to be approval before molecules can go in. And in fact, they have to have a ticket, which is a special protein, an escort to go in. The escort to go in is called um, important. And guess what the chauffeur that gets somebody out is called? Exporting. Those are cool names. We'll get to that in another chapter where we look at the nucleus in much more detail. Again, we're just hitting some of the highlights of these organelles in this chapter to introduce them. So the endoplasmic reticulum, reticulum meaning network, that's directly connected and continuous to the nucleus. We're going to see that our endoplasmic reticulum is responsible in protein processing. Proteins are going to begin to be formed on ribosomes. But we're going to see a lot of ribosomes that are going to be very closely associated with our endoplasmic reticulum. And in an electron microscopic picture, it's going to make the surface of our endoplasmic reticulum look like it's got a little dots on it. And so it's because of that view, how do we describe that endoplasmic reticulum? Rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's rough, I like that R, because of R ribosomes. And as proteins are being made, many of those proteins are going to be extruded into <coughs> the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Those are going to be secreted proteins or lysosomal proteins. But some proteins are also going to get stuck in the membrane of the ER transported to the plasma membrane or transported to the mitochondrial membrane and those are going to be transmembrane proteins for those specific organelles. So protein processing, there's going to be a little bit of uh, modification, maybe some simple sugars added to these proteins, but there's another organelle that does a lot more processing as far as adding sugars to proteins. That's simply the beginning with a rough endoplasmic reticulum. So here we see the nucleus, double membrane, the outer membrane of the nucleus continuous with the folds of our endoplasmic reticulum. You can see all the ribosomes dotted on there. So what is that? What ER? Rough. But there are other portions of the endoplasmic reticulum that do not have ribosomes. And so we say it's a smooth ER. And we're going to see that this portion of the ER is important for the synthesis of lipids and steroids. Primarily, the smooth ER is responsible for producing more membrane. Because from the ER, material is going to pinch off in vesicles and move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the next stop along this processing way for secreted proteins, membrane proteins, and that next stop is going to be the Golgi, but we put ribosomes. I forgot I put this one in this order. Ribosomes, of course, make up the RER, and this is our honorary organelle. Because our ribosomes are responsible for protein synthesis. In your notes, put a parenthesis out by protein synthesis. What is the other trans name for protein synthesis? Translation. Protein synthesis, parentheses, translation. I'm going to, if we don't do anything else this semester, we're going to know the difference between transcription and translation. Where does transcription happen? In the nucleus. If translation happens on the ribosomes, what compartment is that happening in? It's, it's on the surface of the rough ER, but are we in the nucleus or are we in the cytoplasm? Cytoplasm. Those are the two major divisions of the cell. Cytoplasm or nucleus. So transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytoplasm happening on the ribosomes. Some of these can be free ribosomes, but many of them are going to be stuck on the ER forming the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah. Are the nucleus and the ER like directly connected? Mm -hmm. 
Now, not the inside of the nucleus where the DNA is, but the space between the inner and outer membranes of the nucleus, that's continuous with the space inside the ER. So, did they <coughs> label them as different organelles because they do different processes? They're largely distinct because when they were first identified, they looked separate. Mm -hmm. It's only after they were first identified that we begin to appreciate, oh, there is a connection, but there's a functional distinction too. Okay. All right. So ribosomes is where translation occurs. I like to think of ribosomes as the factory where stuff's going to be made. It's just the building. And ribosomes are going to be like your hands. If you put your hands together, you're going to have a space inside. Well, ribosomes are made of two parts, a large and a small part. The large and the small subunit. And inside the ribosome is where the messenger RNA is going to be read, like the ticker on a teletype machine. That messenger RNA is going to slide through there, and that code on the message is going to allow other components to assemble amino acids inside the ribosome into a protein sequence that's going to come out like a pasta extruding machine. And that's what's trying to be illustrated here. There's our RNA code that's being read along, and there comes the protein chain that's being built. The, pro the amino acids are joined together inside the ribosome. It's kind of cool. Okay, so here I kind of got ahead of myself before. From the endoplasmic reticulum that begins processing the proteins, we have these little transport vesicles that leave the ER, and they're sent to the Golgi. This stack of pancakes is what it looks like. These vesicles are going to begin to fuse together to form the first layer of our Golgi. In that chapter, when we talk about Golgi and get to more detail, this is called the cis face, the beginning face. Because the trans face on the outside, this layer is going to disappear. It's going to go away because you're going to have vesicles that pinch off. And those vesicles are going to be like little packages that are going to be sent to the right place. So what does the Golgi do? Well, it adds complex carbohydrates to the proteins. But then it also packages and ships the proteins to the right place. I think you can imagine, you do not want lysosomal proteins going to the mitochondria. So not only do you package them, you've got to make sure they get to the right place. And that's the function of the Golgi, the post office of the cell. It also packages uh, things that are going to go outside of the cell as well. Absolutely. Right? Secreted proteins, membrane-bound proteins, or proteins that are happening with the other membranes inside our organelles of the cell. Yeah. So here's how we put it together. There's the ER. You can see that physical connection. Here we have ribosomes making proteins. And there's the vesicle that's transporting the proteins to the cis face of our Golgi. That's processed as, the, as it moves in this direction. And there's the trans face. And in this case, it's showing the secretion, the secreted material. What would this process be called as the vesicle forms here, opens up, and spits out material? Exocytosis. Exocytosis. So that's a great example of using exocytosis. Animal cells really don't have structures that we can technically refer to as vacuoles. Plants own the vacuole. They love the vacuole, this humongous, large space inside the cell. Now, this vacuole is largely going to be a reservoir for water. You may have some cell sap, but principally cell sap is going to be water. And the reason that you're filling this with water is comparable to in the old days, the 70s and 80s, when we slept on water beds. Has anyone ever slept on a water bed before? I'm not talking about these no motion things you have these days. I'm talking about the old fashioned water bed that would make you seasick, right? If you wanted a firmer, less movable waterbed, you had to fill that sucker full. 
But if you wanted to flop around all night long in the ocean, you didn't put as much water in, right? Because the more water, the tighter that membrane's going to be. Well, in a plant cell, the more water you fill in that vacuole, the more pressure is pushing out on the cell wall, the firmer that cell wall is going to be. If you start taking water out of that vacuole, it gets smaller and it gets smaller. You don't have that support pushing out on the cell wall. You've all done this experiment before. I, I, can't, I kill plants. I, I can't keep plants. But what happens to the plant if you don't water the plant? It wilts, right? It starts to lay over. It's dehydrating because you're lowering the turgor pressure inside of the vacuole. And there's a cool experiment that you, you can do with celery. Again, it sort of gets to osmosis. If you put celery, the, end, the cut end of celery, into pure water, which is a hypotonic solution. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Hypotonic solution. <clears throat> that water is going to fill up inside of that cell because there's more stuff in the cell. Water's going to be attracted in. That's going to be nice, crisp celery. But if you stick the end of the celery into salt water, all of the salt as solute is going to pull water out of the celery. Now, I'm sorry. If I went to the store and I picked up celery that looked like that, I'd put it right back. But do you understand why it's wilting? Because the water in that vacuole has been sucked out and that vacuole shriveling up. That's the function of our vacuole. Now, lysosomes. We've, we've talked about these. These are these degradative enzymes. Hydrolases. Anything you hear with an ASE on the end of it is an enzyme. Hydro. Hydrolysis. Do you see what this enzyme is doing? Breaking things down. And depending on the specific enzyme, you may break down proteins, carbohydrates, fats. Proteases. What do they break down? Proteins. Lipases. What do they break down? Lipids. You can have some carboxylases, but one of the enzymes that break down a lot of carb carbohydrates we have is amylase. It breaks down amylose. And so those are going to be some of our enzymes. So our enzymes, yeah, we break things down. Cellular recycling. We have cells in our body that are like the vacuum cleaners. When a cell dies and you have cellular debris, it goes in, breaks stuff down, recycles the material. Now again, where do we begin the formation of our lysosomes? In the ER with protein synthesis. Package them, that goes and gets modified, folded, fully functional in the Golgi. Packaged up, and as these vesicles pinch off the Golgi, they stay in the cytoplasm. Just waiting for one of these endosomes to have something that it can bind with, inject its hydrolytic enzymes into, and process and recycle. So those are our lysosomes. Peroxisomes, you're not going to identify peroxisomes just by looking at them. You, you find them in, in most, of our, so most of our eukaryotic cells. You're going to find peroxisomes. I think animals and plants probably have the, the highest abundance of these peroxisomes, and they're not going to be as abundant in some cells as others. Like our white blood cells and macrophages, the vacuum cleaner cells, they're going to have a lot of these lysosomes and peroxisomes because that's their job, to recycle material and to get rid of um, uh, cellular debris, pathogens. Now, what's really, really kind of, I don't know, scary and cool, peroxisomes contain, what is that? Did you realize your cells made hydrogen peroxide? Do you also realize you have cells in your body that make hydrochloric acid? I mean, that, that's pretty, you know, BA. I mean, you got some tough cells in there. So peroxisomes, I, these cells, part of our production pathway, ER, Golgi, yeah, 
We're making hydrogen peroxide, storing them in there until we need it to break something down. Is it surprising then that we're going to see these in a lot of our liver cells and kidney cells? Kidneys process waste, liver cells detoxify. So, of course, it makes perfect sense with the function of these cells. Plants, we're going to see that plants use this a bunch for photosynthesis. Aren't we glad? Okay, I'll have to give some props to the botanist. Aren't we glad we have plants? Because without plants, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't. We would have so much CO2 in the atmosphere, we would, we, well, we would have never evolved in the first place. So all important in our function in life and evolution on the planet. That, that's a lot, right? In one category endomembrane system, that's a lot of material. So nucleus, ER, Golgi, and then these vesicular portions, we all group those together into that endomembrane system. So another separate membrane-bound organelle, the mitochondria. What does our mitochondria do? The powerhouse of the cell. Once again, the mitochondria, like the nucleus, has a double membrane. And so what do some evolutionary biologists think? It was on its own that it was this single membrane organism. It was real good at making energy. And it saw this cell over here that already set up a symbiotic relationship to have DNA. And, and it said, hey, can I come work with you guys? Because, I mean, this is pretty cool. I, I can provide you the energy if you kind of organize things and you just give me a place to live. Sure, come on in. Got that extra membrane and went inside. So now your mitochondria have the inner and outer membrane. The inside's folded up in what we call the cristae. And these are going to be important for increasing what? Sur Anytime you see folds, it's increasing surface area. There's a reason for doing that. Because it's the inside membrane that's going to have a lot of membrane proteins that are involved in making this all-important energy-containing molecule called ATP. So if you increase the surface area, you can make more per mitochondria. This is pretty cool. Your nucleus is not the only place where you find DNA in your cells. And so evolutionary biologists also say, wow, there's two membranes for that thing. Maybe it was a separate organism. Well, if it was a separate organism, wouldn't you think that it would have DNA? Huh? Guess what? And what kind of DNA or what shape does the DNA have? What does that sound like? It sounds like a prokaryotic cell. It's, it sounds like a bacterial type cell. So, I mean, we're, we're building a pretty good case for this thing here. And what's also interesting, if you look at that mitochondrial DNA, that isn't recombined. Your nuclear DNA for your 23 sets of chromosomes, that gets all shuffled up and mixed up to make the sperm and the egg. Your mitochondrial DNA and mitochondria divide by binary fission. So your mitochondrial DNA, unless a mutation has happened, is exactly like the mitochondrial DNA of who? Mother. Your mother. Because what do you get from dad? Half a set of chromosomes. What do you get from mom? Everything else. All your mitochondria, all your Golgi, all your ribosomes. Because that's the egg. The only thing the sperm is injecting into the egg is half a set of chromosomes. That's it. So if you look at the mitochondrial DNA and the sequence of mitochondrial DNA and the rate of mutations and all of the different peoples on the planet, guess where our ancestral first humans came from? Where does, where does the fossil record say the first humans arose? Mm -mm. Africa. Africa. And if you look at tribes in Africa, peoples in Europe, the Inuits in uh, the North region, uh, the, the Asians, 
you examine all these populations for their mitochondrial DNA and you look at the mutation rate, mitochondrial DNA predicts the earliest humans and the people that share those traits with the earliest humans come from southern Africa. So the fossil record jives with that mitochondrial DNA. Ye years ago, I forget what it was, but National Geographic came out with a picture of what they would say was the earliest human, and they said the new Eve or, or something like that. And, of course, it was someone from Africa. So it, it's cool when all that stuff kind of works together. We go, ah, that makes sense. Now, in plants, we have these organelles called plastids. And, you know, I had never really heard of a plastid before. Uh, but when you look at them, I think we are familiar with them, at least peripherally, because we know what a chloroplast is. Chloroplast in plants is where photosynthesis occurs. We also have a chromoplast. Chromo, what does that mean? Color, color. So these are the plastids that have pigment. And then we have the ameloplast, which amylose, sugar, makes sense. That's where we store starch in our plants. So plastids specific, unique to plants, and we have our three categories that are divided based on pigmentation, carbohydrate storage, and the production of energy. Notice I said energy? Because really, what's one of the byproducts of photosynthesis? Oxygen. Oxygen, of course, yeah, which we're glad plants do that. What's the other major product of photosynthesis? Glucose. glucose. Who said glucose? Somebody said glucose. Glucose. But what's stored in the chemical bonds of those six carbons? Energy. So the energy from the sun is used to produce ATP. So it does one of the two cycles to photosynthesis, the light and the dark cycle. One cycle produces ATP and, and energy in the form of electrons, which is used in the other cycle to assimilate carbon dioxide in those six carbon dioxide molecules to assimilate them into glucose that we like to eat, me especially. It's not carbs. Sorry, i got to stop that. i got to stop saying that. So here's one of our plastids, the chloroplast. Uh-oh, double membrane. What, what does that sort of hint to? The possibility of a former symbiotic relationship. And the intermembranes of these are stacked up like pennies. They're called thylakoids. And again, we'll talk a lot more about the structure of these, but chloroplast, photosynthesis. It's where we get the energy from the sun. And we're going to use that energy to produce starch, which remember is the storage form of energy in plants. These long arrays of glucose. Uh-oh, guess what? Chloroplasts have DNA. So, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm trying to give you all the pieces and the parts and let you make up your own mind. To me, it's just kind of really interesting that we have all of these things in these different organelles. It's really difficult to describe the cytoskeleton as an organelle because the cytoskeleton is not membrane-bound. The only membrane that is binding in the cytoskeleton is the plasma membrane. But just like your bones, your skeleton supports your body and provides shape to your body, so do these proteins within the cell that we call cytoskeletons. And we have three divisions and three groupings microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. I like listing them in that order because microtubules made of monomers of tubulin are the largest diameter of our filaments of our cytoskeleton. 
Microtubules we use during mitosis to move chromosomes around. So they're big, they're strong. Microtubules set up a rail system inside your neurons. You know, remember we said one of our neurons is like a meter long. And this rail system and other transport proteins can actually carry vesicles and mitochondria to the end of the neuron or back utilizing microtubules as the rail. So these are the largest diameter. Micro, micro being small, are the smallest diameter cytoskeletal element. An example of a microfilament is actin. This is showing actin filamentous network in some of our epithelial cells like our skin or that line the inside of our mouth. But actin, you know, isn't just sort of keeping the cells flat. It's because of actin, our red blood cells have this squished look, biconcave. I say squished jelly donut. I like food analogies, right? And my donut I'm squishing is always chocolate filled. Oh, man. So, largest diameter microtubules, smallest diameter microfilaments. Guess what sized cytoskeletal element has a diameter that's in between those two? You see where we get the name? Intermediate between, well, what are they between? Different size. Intermediate filaments are going to be structural. And, and some of these intermediate filaments, like Desmond, is specific in muscle. So if you have a tumor that expresses the intermediate filament Desmond, you know that that tumor started from some muscle cell somewhere, and that would help you try to go find that primary tumor site. So some of the functions, internal framework, give us a shape like our red blood cells. Cell division, microtubules, moving the chromosomes. Or we're going to use these as anchors or scaffold. That's a pretty cool word for cells to use as they're hanging on to stuff and moving. As cells are crawling and using our extracellular proteins to move. If our transmembrane receptors didn't have anything inside to hang on to, as you pulled on the membrane, those, those receptors would just pull out of the phospholipid layer. So this anchors everything together as cells are doing what they do. So there's our microtubule, inner diameter of 15 nanometers. Here's our microfilament, total diameter of 7 nanometers. And there's our little in-between guys, maybe upwards of 12. It's kind of cool when these things are named and it makes sense, and not just some whacked out name that makes absolutely no, why would they call it a Weibel Pilate body? Well, these two guys have one of their names stuck on it. So one of the distinctions between animal and plant cells is the cell wall. And we've already talked about the structural component of the cell wall, which is carbohydrates. And so that's where we find cellulose. But what's really cool is that when you look at adjacent plant cells, and you think about that cell wall, this very structural, hard material. You may think there's no way these cells could communicate because you've got all this cell wall between. No, they're, they're little tunnels. And plasma membrane extensions going through these tunnels in the cell wall that are called plasma desmata. So they can communicate together, which is really pretty cool, right? Because when you think of cells in your body, we don't have any cells that have this problem, do we? Oh, yes, we do. You have bone cells called osteocytes that are completely surrounded by bone. How are cells living that are embedded in this hard calcium phosphate stuff we call bone? They make little tunnels in the bone, and every cell interconnects with cell processes to the next one. And finally, one cell is connected to a capillary. So this cell gets the oxygen and says, OK, I'm going to use some. I'm going to pass some to the next neighbor, and on and on and on. So the same sort of design happens in plants as it does in your bone cells to keep all the cells communicating and to keep cells alive.
Now, just as we finish this out, I, I think we pretty much know about viruses, these particles, mm, living, mm, not living, we don't like them, certainly cause a lot of trouble. But we have these invaders of the cell, viruses, viroids, and prions. I think, I think this, is, this is a pretty cool definition of a virus. It's a very nerdy one. See this on Big Bang Theory. Non-cellular parasitic particles. But they are incapable of free living unless they find a host. So that, that kind of makes sense. They kind of act alive, but they've got to have a living cell with which to then expand on themselves, replicate themselves, and make more. So, and they're not living because they don't have any cells. No cytoplasm, no ribosomes, no organelles, really no membrane to speak of. But what's really kind of funny, viruses can actually infect bacteria. Those are the cool kind of viruses. And those are called bacteriophages. And when these things were identified, molecular biologists begin using these all the time to take them so that they could put DNA and plasmids into other bacteria to get the bacteria to do what they wanted and study them. It's actually kind of pretty cool how that works. Viruses are tiny, tiny. Notice we're talking about cells, red blood cell. What was my red blood cell diameter again? Eight microns. Viruses are 25 nanometers. So, a, you know, almost a thousandfold smaller than we see with our eukaryotic cells. What drives a virus to continue, I think, is simply um, this molecular programming. If it attaches, it's going to do its thing. If it doesn't attach, it's just waiting until it attaches. I mean, it, it's almost like a recording that just waits for somebody to press play. Because when you look at the viral life cycle, that's it. it. It has to attach first. And when we look at many of these, including our retroviruses. Have you heard of retroviruses? What does retro mean? And don't say old. I knew somebody was going to say old. <laughs> retro often means backward. And maybe we're backward because we're old. Retro means backwards. And when you hear a retrovirus, the backward part is the nucleic acid. Because in many viruses and in our living cells, our genome is made up of what nucleic acid? What's in our nucleus? Don't make it too hard. DNA. Everybody's like, D DNA? DNA. So a retrovirus that's backwards has what as its nucleic acid genome? RNA. A-N-D, is that what you said? Did you really just say A-N-D? Wow. No, oh, that's true. RNA. So RNA is the genome of retroviruses, like AIDS, the, the AIDS virus, HIV. It has RNA as its genome, but it infects the cell, takes over the machinery of the cell, the synthetic machinery, and so the cell starts making viral particles until the cell dies and poof, releases all of these viruses out into the, the environment so it can affect other cells. In physiology, when we talk about HIV, the really insidious part of HIV is it can practically be dormant for 10 years. And during those 10 years, it's slowly destroying your immune system. That's, that's the bad part uh, about that. Viroids, like viruses, very small, maybe three to 400 nucleotides very, very small, but in fact, primarily plants. But they're circular RNA. Unlike plastids and bacteria, which are circular DNA, these can be very, very detrimental to plants. Uh, you know, they can be transmitted in the seed, in the pollen, and this is particularly difficult when we think of a lot of our invasive aquatic plants around this part of East Texas. The way they get from one lake to the next lake is usually in the live well of fishing boats. They drain that live well in the next lake, let out the spores or the plants, boom, 
it takes off. So viroids, small circular RNA. Prions, as the name implies, this sounds like the beginning of proteins, when in fact prions are proteins that have folded up in the wrong way. And they're folded up in the wrong way, so number one, they don't function adequately. And number two, it makes it difficult for the cell to remove them. And so it's going to be a problem because it's almost like gangrene, because gangrene can cause the next cell to die and the next cell to die. Well, these prions can actually cause other proteins to do this, and it sets off this whole cascade of forming these prions that accumulate together to form amyloid. And as this amyloid gets bigger and bigger, that's one of the key characteristics of, unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease. So we have a lot of neurodegenerative neuro, uh, diseases and neurological defects that are caused simply because proteins don't fold right. When we talk about folding, we're talking about what structure? Secondary. And if the secondary structure is not right, that's going to affect the tertiary structure. And if that's not right, it can absolutely affect the quaternary structure and the full functional, the functionality of that molecule. So, uh, Crutchfeldt Jakob, mad cow disease, many, many, many of these are going to be caused, in fact, by prions.